Welcome to the new old computer show. This is a Macintosh Plus. And uh, if you have one of these at home and you haven't uh, done any maintenance work on it, uh, there are some things that you absolutely have to do to keep using your old uh, Mac Plus as well as uh, the Mac 512K and the Mac uh, 128K. And in this video, I'm going to go through the steps on how to refurbish one of these old Macs so that you can use it reliably for many years to come. A uh, person locally uh, reached out and uh, asked if I could um, refurbish this for, for him. This machine had apparently worked really well for a long time, uh, but as of late had started glitching out during operation. So I said I was happy to, to help out and look at it. Um, I have a lot of uh, affection for these, uh, these old Macs. Um, the Mac Plus was my introduction to, to the Mac uh, in sometime in the late 80s. And um, I've uh, refurbished a few of these um, so far. And uh, I know that these, uh, these Pluses have a range of, of known issues. So for one, they infamously have no cooling fan. So they run pretty hot, especially uh, around the CRT and the analog board on this side. And that causes components to degrade as well as uh, solder joints to crack. Uh, causing all sorts of uh, glitches and instability. They also infamously have filter caps uh, made by a company called Rifa that's, uh, that sits on the main voltage side of the, um, the analog board. And uh, those also degrade over time, and they crack, and uh, they short out and they explode. Those explosions aren't fatal to the computer or particularly dangerous. Um, but it does release a nasty odor, odor um, and, uh, and just causes a mess inside. Um, so it's good to preemptively replace those uh, anytime you are opening one of these uh, computers up. Those filter caps are energized even when the power switch is, is set to off, so if you have the um, power cord plugged in to the wall and uh, the computer just sitting in the corner, um, you may get fireworks at any time, so it is recommended to refurbish these computers um, preemptively. So, um, first things first, let's uh, open this up and inspect uh, what it looks like inside. Behind this cover here sits a PRM and clock battery. You just uh, remove the cover and remove the battery. And hopefully the battery hasn't leaked. It's in there very tightly. Let's use a little tool. And it's out. So this is a, uh, a special form factor. This is not your typical AA battery. It's a 4.5 volts um, alkaline battery. And I don't think it has leaked. And uh, now we have exposed one case screw here. We have two case screws here and the two more case screws underneath the bezel here. So at this point, we want to uh, put the Mac uh, face down. And we have this uh, desk cover here to, uh, to protect the bezel from any scratches. And to open up a compact Mac, uh, you need what's colloquially called a Mac cracker, uh, namely a Torx T15 driver with a long shaft, uh, because you need to reach deep into the, uh, uh, the top of the case. So uh, here comes the tricky part, which is to remove the back of the case from the front bezel. They can be pretty stubborn, um, especially if they haven't been opened before. Let's start with the uh, bottom two screws. Take the battery compartment screw out. And then we take the uh, top screws out. So a good idea is to 
fully unscrew one of them first, turn the computer upside down very gently to see if we can get it out. Okay, there it came out. And then we used the very last bezel screw uh, as leverage. So we can uh, push down with our Torx screwdriver as we lift the computer up a little bit uh, while we unscrew it. And uh, this is in order to uh, um, assist with uh, getting the bezel off from the, uh, the back case, uh, which can be very stubborn. Um, so this is a more of an art than a science. Can push down. Let's see, unscrew the screw. I don't think that entirely helped, but maybe to start. Okay, it's not coming out. It's very stuck in there, the last screw. to get these screws out before you start to really pry the case apart because oftentimes they, they get stuck in the, in the threads there. Oh yeah, it's not coming out. So we, we may have to start prying a little bit at the edge here. So I have some plastic tools like this uh, in order not to cause any damage It's definitely the most stubborn compact Mac case screw that I have encountered so far. So I'm not quite sure what it's, it's stuck on there. It's, I'm gonna try some uh, compressed air and see if we can rattle something loose. And it came out. All right. So, um, compressed air into the hole. And uh, that created uh, some, some vacuum, I suppose, that just pushed it out. New trick. It's really cold. <laughs> so, uh, note that the um, Bottom case screws are these 
machine screws. They screw into the, the metal chassis. Whereas uh, the upper three screws, they are, they are threaded for plastic. So don't mix them up. And Apple helpfully color coded them as well so that the machine screws are black and the plastic screws are, uh, they're, they're not made of plastic, but they screw into plastic. Um, they are unpainted. So uh, step two. So step two, try and separate the front and the back of the case. And this is where it becomes helpful uh, to use gravity. This requires some care not to uh, cause damage, but um, the most effective way uh, to do this is to hold this up with the Mac face down and then allow gravity to pull on the front of the case because yeah, the uh, CRT is attached to the, the bezel here, so it's pretty heavy. Yeah, so this is fairly stuck, so I think I need to uh, go back to my plastic tools, see if I can pry. Alright, I th think the prying helped there. It's like I'm just lifting up on the corner of the computer and then using the plastic tool to pry and then pull down. The critical part is to get the top separated because this is where it's most stuck. The bottom part here is not as stuck normally. So as long as you, you're able to lift the top part up, you should be golden. The rest should just come off, like so. Voila! So I'm going to do the basic safety precaution, which is to discharge the CRT. So later Macs have a, what's called a bleed resistor that will very quickly discharge CRTs after the, um, the computer is turned off. However, I don't think the plus has that, so there may actually be um, a couple of thousand volts left in this um, CRT. I'm going to use my uh, homemade discharging tool, which is uh, simply a um, fairly heavy gauge wire, uh, two alligator clips, and a flat headed screwdriver. The important part here is to connect the other end of the discharge tool um, to where the uh, ground wire from the neck board is connected on the Mac which is right here on the top left. So in order to get a good grip there, I need to just gently unscrew this screw there so I can pull the ground wire to the side. And screw it back on. That, that way I can get a better grip with my alligator clip. So the alligator clip goes on there. You need to make sure it's it's on there good. And um, then you insert the uh, flat-headed screwdriver uh, underneath the A-node cap that sits here on the CRT. So um, try, try to not scratch the, the red paint here, because the red paint is there for reasons protect against arcing. Um, so just gently lift on the A-node cap, slide it under, and then uh, make sure that the uh, screwdriver bumps up against the uh, the terminal of the anode cap there. And if there was any uh, charge left in this CRT, you would, we would have seen a spark there, but I didn't see a spark. So uh, this was uh, fully discharged. 
Okay, so uh, the machine is uh, ready to be worked on now. Um, so these compact Macs are put together in a very specific way and you need to uh, disassemble them in a very specific order. Um, the first thing you want to do is to remove the RF shield from the bottom. It sits underneath the uh, logic board. The logic board is exposed. And, uh, and then we want to unplug the floppy drive ribbon cable and the uh, interconnection header that goes to the analog board. Ribbon cable, just gently pull at it. It should just come right out. The uh, interconnection header can be a bit more stubborn. So you have to kind of plug at it. Carefully, you don't slip and bump into the neck of the CRT. This is this is glass here. If the CRT neck cracks, uh, air will make it into uh, the CRT and uh, it will be ruined. And also, you may cut yourself on the glass, so be very careful. Really stubborn. So the logic board itself sits on uh, on little rails here, and uh, it slides uh, up and out. There, came right out. That is a. Uh, somewhat dusty um, Macintosh Plus uh, logic board. But it otherwise seems to be in, uh, in very good shape. The 68,000 CPU it has a 1989 date code. So um, this Plus was uh, must have been manufactured very late in the, uh, the life cycle of this machine. By 1989 we would have had the the SE30 on the market. The Mac Plus has um, high quality axial electrolytic capacitors and uh, they typically do not ever leak. Um, so uh, preemptive uh, recapping is, is not something I generally recommend for, um, for the Plus. So yeah, I'll just uh, give this a little bit of a wipe down to get the, um, the dust off, but uh, we'll set this aside for now. So once the logic board is, is removed, you have uh, access to the drive bay if you, if you uh, so desire. Uh, there are four screws here that hold the drive bay in, so you can uh, pull the floppy drive out if you need to, to uh, service it. The, the main act today is of course the analog board that sits here. And uh, in order to remove the analog board, um, we need to disconnect it from the rest of the system. Um, so yeah, before, of course, before touching the analog board, um, you don't want to do that right after uh, it's been powered up because there is high voltage. But this has been off for hours, so um, I'm not concerned about high voltage at this point. Uh, so what you want to do is uh, to disconnect the interconnection header for the, uh, the CRT itself, it sits down here. So I expect all of these to be quite stubborn. Um, so it has a little plastic clip that you can press down on that will help pull it out, most likely. There we go, it comes out. And then uh, CRT uh, Neck board. So the neck board on the plus is, is just this little cir circular cap here. Um, you want to grab onto that and gently just pull it straight out. Then you grab onto the the neck board header and gently wiggle it out of its uh, its home there. And again, be very, very careful not to. Uh, uh, slip and bump into the um, the neck here. So uh, there's the uh, 
neckboard connector, and this is what's uh, connected to the the ground on the uh, the chassis there. Um, and next, of course, you want to uh, unplug the um, anode cap. So now that it's been uh, safely discharged, uh, it should be a matter of uh, grabbing grabbing onto it. There, there are two little metal clips in here that are holding on to the CRT. So you want to just pull that to the side and then just wiggle it until it comes comes loose. So that came off easily. Then of course we have the interconnection uh, lead to, uh, cable to the logic board, but since that's been disconnected on the logic board side, we can leave that on for now. Next we need to unscrew the analog board. We have two screws here, we have one screw there. And then on top here, we have this little ground clip uh, that I believe is, is there to ensure that there is solid ground connection between the analog board and the chassis here. So make sure not to lose that one. And then there's uh, one more screw here on top, uh, which is another ground lead that goes uh, directly from the, the mains voltage uh, plug um, onto the chassis as well. So you want to unscrew that. And it's only that that last screw on the top there that's of a different kind. The three screws that we took out before that are all the same, interchangeable. And uh, now we should be able to wiggle the, uh, the analog board loose here. So it's kind of resting on two little clips here. So you need to wiggle it, wiggle it out of those clips. And then it should uh, lift right off, like so. We will uh, put the rest of the uh, mat aside for now. Have a quick look at the CRT. This is a Samsung OEM. Again, what, 1989, uh, probably 30th week, made in Korea. And now we can uh, just easily remove the interconnection cable for, for the logic board. So let's uh, inspect the analog board. Of course, the first thing you want to, uh, to look at just, just by the mains voltage uh, intake here, you have the uh, very typical uh, reefer capacitors, these three little brown blocky components. And these are the ones that uh, explode. So we are going to replace these for sure before we do anything else with this uh, computer. Um, of course the, the chances that they will explode right now is probably fairly low. Um, but I, I don't want to take the risk because uh, once they blow up, they cause a mess, a lot of grime and soot uh, on the uh, analog board. Plus, it smells really bad. So let's uh, inspect the, uh, the rest of the board. See if there are any obvious faults anywhere. So one thing you can uh, look out for is um, components that are scorched. So unfortunately, the flyback transformer seems to have a lot of hours on it. You can tell that uh, by the way that the uh, uh, the sealant here has uh, deteriorated, and uh, there's almost like salt crystals that are, that are forming uh, around here. So um, doesn't necessarily mean that it's about to break down, but it's me it means that it's, it has been uh, uh, used a lot, probably. Um, so for good measure, I just I, I, I like to just scrape off the uh, the salt-like residue on these.
course, while being careful not to cause unnecessary damage to them. So next up, in order to access the underside of this uh, PCB, which we uh, need to have in order to replace these uh, components here, um, uh, we, we need to uh, remove the uh, insula insulating sheet, this thing here. So in order to do that, we need to uh, remove these little plastic clips. So this is where it's uh, handy to have something like uh, a cheap pick because you need to just get underneath them and then uh, pry them upwards Uh, or even better, one of these uh, sturdier plastic tools. So we they can be really stubborn to get out, uh, but uh, they should eventually come out if you just pry upwards. One more. Third one, it's pretty stubborn. And uh, out it comes. So there we have it. There's the uh, protective sheet. And uh, just fun fact, um, Apple put seven different uh, translations of, of these warning messages uh, onto these uh, these sheets. So we have all the major languages uh, that were uh, important in the in the eighties, right? And Swedish, as a Swedish person. I find that amusing. I'm not sure why they decided to put Swedish on uh, on on these uh, these sheets, but um, I suppose it was a market of interest for them for for Apple at the time. And uh, I think they kept this exact exact uh, lineup of languages for the entire life cycle of um, the Compact Max. So you still have these on the Classic, I think, or the Classic Two. So fun fact: they got the spelling wrong on this one here. The translation for width should have been uh, B R E D D, bread. Uh, but they uh, put B, B R E D O, bredo, which is not a word in Swedish, at least. And this typo uh, persisted through the again the entire life cycle of a uh, compact black and white Max. All right, so uh, let's make note of um, which components we should desolder. It's always uh, handy to. Uh, do a little markings underneath so that we uh, don't desolder the, uh, the wrong legs. I believe we want these ones. These ones. And these ones. So I just put an X in between uh, the two legs that need to be uh, desoldered. This should be a quick job. Of course, with a PCB of this age, it's very easy to, uh, to cause damage. So uh, I like to be careful. Let's get a little bit of flux. Get the pump ready. Flux.
think we got most of the solder out, but let's uh, do just a little bit of cleanup with the, uh, with the wick. Make sure there are no stragglers. So oftentimes, uh, when during manufacturing, they they bent the component legs over like this. So you want to bend them back in order to uh, to be able to cleanly extract them without um, damaging the through holes. Now we should be able to uh, extract these capacitors. Let's wiggle a little bit, wiggle, wiggle. So this is where I discovered that despite my uh, best intentions, I uh, desoldered the wrong component. Um, it should have been these two. Now we should be able to extract it. There we go, one extracted uh, reefer cap. Next one. Comes right out. And uh, final one. And of course, resolder the component that we uh, accidentally uh, desoldered. Aside and uh, inspect the components that we uh, removed. So here's the big one. Never mind, I, I caused a little bit of damage there, which is uh, fine because we're going to discard this uh, this capacitor. So this is a Rifa, genuine Rifa. Uh, rated for 250 volts, 0 0.1 microfarads, X2. And uh, when you source uh, replacements for these, um, there are three things you need to uh, watch out for. Uh, first is, of course, the, for, of course the voltage rating. Um, that should be about twice of the voltage that it's expected to uh, to have to deal with. So yes, uh, since this we are in the we are in North America here, so. Um, twice uh, of 120 volts. Then of course the uh, capacitance needs to be correct, 0.1 microfarads. And then uh, the rating, so this is rated for X2. Um, and uh, they're also uh, Y rated, uh, 
uh, capacitors, and that has to do with um, uh, the way that they are guaranteed to to fail. So if they fail, they should even either fail closed or fail open, right? So either they uh, they get shorted out when they fail, or they get infinite resistance. Yeah, so these uh, X, this class X capacitor, uh, they are expected to uh, to fail open, uh, which means that they they will short out when they fail. Then we have these small ones. Uh, you can see that they are actually class Y, uh, which are designed to uh, fail closed. You need to make sure you replace with the, the correct class of capacitors. Otherwise, uh, the device may become a, uh, an electrocution hazard in the unlikely event of a malfunction of some sort. Um, so yeah, these uh, small, small uh, Rifa caps are rated 250 volts as well, 2200 picofarads, and uh, Y class. And of course, genuine Rifa. And fun fact, I believe Rifa was also originally a Swedish company. Uh, sorry about that world. Um, but they're owned uh, by someone else now. And then the final cap, of course, um, oops, caused quite a bit of damage there, um, which I think is a sign that this was uh, uh, about to fail. Um, this is exactly the same as, uh, as the other small capacitor. So this may be uh, an unpopular choice, uh, but I'm actually going to replace uh, the Rifa caps with Rifa caps. And um, I have uh, in stock, luckily, uh, both kinds. So the first one, uh, of course, is the uh, 0.1 microfarad capacitor. Rated for 300 volts, it's X2 class, and uh, the DigiKey Digi sold them to me as uh, 0 0.1 microfarad uh, capacitors, so uh, I trust them. And uh, yeah, if, if somebody knows how to interpret these uh, these markings, uh, please let me know. And here they are, brand new uh, paper-based <laughs> uh, Rifa caps. So yeah, uh, it's a choice. And yeah, please, please let me know your opinion about this in the in the comment section. But um, from my take on this is, if this will last thirty years, I think that's perfectly acceptable. You know. Um, and yeah, if a future owner will have to replace these again uh, in the uh, 2050s, uh, then uh, they may do so. But uh, I, I do trust that uh, manufacturing techniques do improve over time, and uh, that uh, this this new version of uh, of the infamous Rifa cap um, is going to be uh, a little bit more reliable, perhaps. So there you have it, Rifa Reunion, happening right here. So Rifa caps are not polarized, so we can put them in, in any orientation that we like. Of course, the um, one common issue here is um, that the, the capacitor that you, you put in is actually uh, a bit smaller than the, the one you took out, so that the legs don't uh, line up perfectly with uh, the holes. So what I'd like to do is, is just to uh, use pliers to uh, create a little, uh, little bend, and then just wing it, create, create the, um, you just shape them like this, and um, that usually uh, works out. So we need to, I think we need to adjust this a little bit more. It's a 
perfect fit. Just pop it in there. Bend over the leads so that we can... Uh, it's easy to solder. And then uh, these smaller caps I think are still the exact right form factor. Just pop them right in. Hold on to them so they can, uh, can bend the leads over on the other side, like so. And then well, we just solder them on. Snip off the legs. And we should be good. It's a good idea to, to wipe off this um, anode cap lead because they get very sooty. So yeah, now this computer shouldn't explode on us anymore. So uh, it's time to actually go and uh, troubleshoot the issue that the uh, owner experienced in the first place. Um, and that issue I don't think had anything to do with um, the filter capacitors. And the old Rifa caps go in the trash. So in order to test it's important that we hook everything up. Uh, everything is needed in order to have a functioning computer. I'm not going to reattach the insulation sheet, um, so, but I will uh, be very careful um, not to touch anything here while the computer is running. So we connect the CRT back. Connect the A note cap. Just angle it in there into its little hole. Put the logic board interconnection uh, cable in. Connect, connect the neck board interconnection and the neck board itself. Double check that the uh, ground lead is uh, is connected. That's super important when uh, running a CRT. It needs to be grounded, otherwise you're in big trouble. And we need the logic board too um, because it's a logic board that generates um, an image. Connect the logic board. And this should uh, 
give us a, a functioning machine. So let's put it up like so. But in fact, it's uh, probably advisable to uh, connect the ground lead for the analog board as well. In any case, if we, we need to boot into software, we should probably connect the floppy drive as well. Okay, we're ready to, uh, to test this machine to see if we can experience uh, the issue that uh, uh, the owner uh, described. So I'm now, now going to run uh, this machine without the back case on. And obviously we have a lot of high voltage here mains voltage here. This is very dangerous. Um, I will be very careful not to uh, touch anything. Let's turn the machine on. By the way, this, uh, this CRT is pretty dim. You have to uh, bring it up very high in the brightness to, to get any picture. Obviously, nothing bad happens right away. To assist in the troubleshooting efforts of uh, Mac Pluses, I like to use my mallet. Mallets are nifty. Um, this one is nifty because it's all wooden rubber. So uh, I run very little risk hurting myself poking around um, in a running computer. Of course, you don't want to hit it too hard. So you don't want to damage the computer either. But what I like to do is to poke at the analog board. And uh, it's actually, <laughs> it's doing nothing. The computer is still working perfectly. So if there, if there are cracked solder joints here, they are not very severe. Let's boot into software and see what happens. So let's uh, hook up a mouse in order to operate this computer. Um, this is actually a Apple II mouse. The Apple mouse. Model number A2M4015, made in USA. And um, this, this particular Apple II mouse is perfectly Macintosh compatible. So let's boot with the uh, boot disk that the, um, uh, the owner was using. Still no glitching. Let's try something else. Let's have it boot into some random software. 
It's just a text adventure called Amazon. Uh, based on the novel by uh, Matt Crichton. It's really stable. So a bummer that we can't actually reproduce the issue that the uh, the owner was seeing. And I think the act of transporting the computer uh, from his place to my place uh, will, will could have uh, inadvertently um, resolved the issue. Um, my theory is that uh, there was some poor contact somewhere um, in between the logic board and the CRT. Um, what I've seen in the past is the the CRT netboard socket itself um, that, is, that, that easily gets uh, oxidized contacts um, that causes a poor, uh, a poor connection uh, which can um, give you that um, loss of picture uh, that he was seeing. Um, so we can't say for sure whether um, whatever repairs that I do will actually permanently resolve the issue um, but there are two preventative measures that I want to take. Uh, one is to reflow the solder joints um, that are known to be problematic on the uh, analog board, so typically the ones that sit by the interconnection sockets. Uh, and then secondly, to uh, uh, put contact cleaner into uh, the various contacts here. Okay, so, so the interconnection headers that I was talking about are this one, this one, and this one. Um, and also, really anything that sits around these large heat sinks and the uh, flyback, uh, those are parts that run pretty hot and can easily uh, result in cracked solder joints. The cracks that we talk about are going to be very fine hairline type cracks. And um, you either, I think I need, you either need a much better microscope or uh, I, I like to use my loop which is better at this. So I'm going to inspect with my loop instead to give me a better picture. Oh yeah, I found one crack. This is clearly a cracked solder joint right here. Uh, the bottom most pin of uh, this header, there is a cracked solder joint. So let's uh, reflow the solder joints um, in, the, in and around the common failure areas. Add some flux. Reflow. Let the let let the solder bubble a little bit. This one, these ones here. So this now we're doing the one that was clearly 
clearly cracked. Very nice. Last one right here. That's good for now. Let's clean it up. I'm going to take this opportunity to uh, put a lot of contact cleaner into all of the contacts. So I have some uh, CRC QD electronics cleaner. And the first thing I always like to do on these um, these old analog boards is to um, put some contact cleaner into the potentiometer by the brightness control because they can get pretty oxidized. back and forth and then because it's a big potentiometer I like to go next with a little bit of deoxid fader lube to give it some lubrication going to go for broke and uh, put the uh, insulating sheet back on as well. Putting it back is very easy, you just use this little, take these little black clips again and uh, push them right in. Another part board is back on. So this neck board socket here is uh, one that gets particularly easily oxidized in my experience. So these these little pins here. Um, so I'm going to use a little bit of this Ma Mr. Clean Magic Eraser uh, to to try and scrub off some of that oxidation. Next, let's get some uh, contact cleaner into all of the contacts.
last but not least the uh, backboard socket itself. Let's just slide that in, on and off a couple of times. Computer uh, put back together. Let's um, try and boot it up. See, make sure we didn't break anything. Ground lead. Ground lead. Everything attached. So it seems good. the button. Okay, so we didn't break the computer. Um, so I think uh, let's uh, bang on it a little bit to, to see if uh, we can get it to glitch. Of course we couldn't get it to glitch in the first place, so Flex it a bit here, flexy, 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 flex. No? Yeah, I don't think uh, we did any harm at least. One thing that I noticed is that this CRT is fairly dim. So ideally when the brightness is in the middle, uh, you should have a, a nice and bright picture. However, in, on this machine you really have to bring it to the almost absolute maximum in, in order to get a, a usable brightness. So one thing you can do there is to just increase the drive on the uh, flyback itself to, to just uh, have the analog board send more voltage in, into the CRT. It'll give you a little bit of a brightness boost um, for, uh, for a while at least. And uh, for, for safety, of course, you want to use uh, plastic tools like this when working inside uh, of a high voltage uh, circuitry. The markings here tell you uh, what these adjustments are doing. And uh, what we want to adjust is the cutoff. So it's this potentiometer right here. And uh, as we're adjusting potentiometers, of course, it's good to get some uh, contact cleaner in them for good measure. Spinning it a little bit to get the uh, contact cleaner worked in, like so. All right, so let's uh, turn on the computer. And then we want to put the uh, brightness to roughly the middle point, I should say. This is the max, this is the min, so this is the middle point roughly. And uh, let's adjust the cutoff and see if we can get a little bit more brightness. There we go. That looks a lot better. So all that's left uh, for us to do is to uh, put the back case uh, back on and uh, screw it all together.
I'm making an informed decision not to put the battery back in for now. Um, who knows how old this battery is? Uh, the charge it only has uh, 0 0.4 volts of charge, so uh, that's a dead battery. So this concludes today's video. Uh, the only thing I didn't do that I usually do with uh, uh, when refurbishing an old Mac uh, is to uh, uh, do maintenance of the uh, floppy drive. Uh, this floppy drive seems to work uh, great for now, um, but at uh, one point or another it's going to need uh, a new eject motor gear. Um, but uh, this uh, old Mac uh, is now uh, ready to be uh, handed back to its owner and uh, hopefully be uh, uh, used and loved for many years to come. Anyways, uh, if you like this video, don't hesitate to push that like button. And if you want to see more of my new old computer projects, um, don't hesitate to subscribe. And uh, thank you all for watching, and uh, have a great rest of your day. Bye.